Hi, I'm Jessica Chichester. I run for the Dashing Whippets in New York City. I placed fifth in the Boston Marathon 2018. I guess one message that I would like to send to other runners is that you can really do anything that you set your mind to. A positive attitude will go a really long way. Um, if you tell yourself you can't do something, then you can't do it. If you tell yourself you can, that will take you to the moon. Right now I'm reading the Dina Castor book, Let Your Mind Run, um, and it's all about like how, how much running is a mental sport, and it's so true. Um, you know, it's not, it's not all physical, it's not all about the training, it's about your attitude um, and, and putting your mind into it. So that's the strategy that has worked for me the most, I think. And if you set your mind to what you want to do, then you can do whatever you want to do, too. I felt very surprised with the results and very confused at first, uh, but eventually very happy and, you know, I'm still feeling very happy about it. I expected to come in the top 30 at the Boston Marathon. Well, when I finished the race, um, there was a lot of things going on. I was freezing cold, I was soaking wet, and I needed to get to bag check to get my cell phone and my belongings so that I could get warm um, and get an Uber. <laughs> so, uh, finally, when I got my phone, I just had you know, a flood of text messages. It said I had 200 text messages, so I knew something really good happened. I knew I did well. Um, but then I, I'm looking at them and there's tons of screenshots and it says I'm in fifth place. So I thought maybe this was just like the leaderboard at some point or maybe an error. Um, but then I finally, I got my mom on the phone and she's kept telling me I got fifth place and at that point I'm in my Uber and I was like talking to my Uber driver I'm like I got fifth place in the Boston Marathon <laughs> and that's when it kind of finally started to sink in and I realized what had happened. I'm from a small town called Mount Morris the population is about 5,000 uh, there's about two stoplights in the town and the high school I went to was actually a K through 12th grade. That's how small like our town was. And I graduated with a class of about 40. Um, <clears throat> very small town, not a lot going on. Um, I didn't move immediately to New York City after leaving my town. I went to college at University at Albany. So that was kind of like a step toward a city. It was a, you know, a bigger town. A little more going on. Um, <clears throat> and after I left Albany, I, I started travel nursing a little bit. I came to New York City for a few months, um, and then I went out to Los Angeles for a few months, and then I came back here, and I that's when I started clicking with the Dashing Whippets running team, and I got a job here, and then I ended up you know, staying here permanently. Um, so I'm still here. Um, I love it here. I live in Brooklyn now. Um, I did migrate from Manhattan uh, like a year and a half ago. So I like it a lot and I, I think I'll be around here for quite a while now. Well, I've been running for about 20 years. Um, in high school, I was pretty competitive amongst like my peers, but I, w I, I went to a really small school. Um, so overall, I, I wasn't like that good, but in my, in my school, I was pretty, pretty talented. Um, <clears throat> and then I went on to college. I didn't run my freshman year because I wanted to focus on school, but the following three years, I did uh, cross country and track and field. Um, but this time I was in a division one school, so uh, I was I was not really considered that that good. <laughs> um, after that, uh, after I graduated, I started marathoning pretty much immediately. My s older sister had done a marathon um, like the year before I graduated, and I was just thinking, oh, I, I can't wait until I can do that. 
so then, I mean, I've been long distance running and marathon training ever since then. Um, about three years ago, three, four years ago, uh, when I moved to New York City, I started training with the Dashing Whippets, and that's when I really started uh, training and like being competitive with marathons. Prior to that, it was just for fun. I would just run pretty casually and sign up for a marathon here and there and do it with my family. But once I started training with the team, like I, I got super into it, and everyone around me was super into it, so it was really motivating, and uh, that's when I really started training hard and focusing on like time goals for a marathon. I train a lot in Central Park because most of my team meets there. Um, I train a lot in Greenpoint, Williamsburg area because this is where I live. So I'll do a lot of easy running um, here and there. Uh, I also work in Queens, so I find myself running to and from work pretty often just to be a time saver. Uh, for track workouts, I used to do them on the East River track. Um, with my team and then the East River track got shut down for construction. So then I was using McCarran Park uh, track. I finally convinced some people to come over to Brooklyn and work out on the McCarran Park track with me. But then a month till the marathon, they shut down the track. So I had a couple of critical workouts I needed to get in, which you know I would have done on McCarran track. So we ended up going into the uh, Queens Astoria Park track and had to use that, um, which is, you know, not very convenient to get to, but you got to do what you got to do. Um, so yeah, I train all over. I train in Prospect Park a little bit. Um, probably going to do a little more of that leading up to the Brooklyn Half Marathon because some of the courses takes place in Prospect Park. So. Everyone heard about the brutal weather conditions at the Boston Marathon, um, and it was pretty horrendous. I think actually the anticipation leading up to it was even worse because I had been training so hard and had my heart set on this race that when I saw the weather forecast, I was just like devastated. Um, but once I got on the actual course, you know, I just had the adrenaline pumping and I was like, I'm here, I'm going to do this, like this wind and this rain and this freezing cold weather is not going to stop me and uh, just the energy of people on the course and the music and all my surroundings just took over and I, I mean, I just got in a zone and like I didn't even pay attention to the weather. I just was like racing like the entire time and like plowing through these crowds of people and puddles and <laughs> I mean it was it was just crazy um, and of course uh, training in New York through the winter did prepare me well for it because the weather here is not um, the greatest uh, I mean I try to avoid actually training outside when it's horrible out but um, sometimes it's unavoidable so, I mean, there were times that I was running along, um, like, Franklin Ave with just also, like, 20 to 30 mile per hour headwinds on those really windy days, or, like, doing intervals on a snow-covered track. Um, and, I mean, not just this winter. Like, I've been training through this, these winters the past 20 years of my life, like, I remember training in tr like track for college, like having hail pelting out my face and like my face almost bleeding. Like so, so I mean I'm not um, unfamiliar with training in terrible weather and racing in terrible weather. Um, and in fact, I did a half marathon about like eight or nine weeks before. Boston Marathon, which had really similar conditions, and also like the the whole course elevation map um, on the half marathon was very similar to Boston Marathon. So I just kept thinking, okay, Boston Marathon is just that race, um, just a little longer, <laughs> and I did that, so I could do this. My training plan, um, it. I don't think it's very different from, you know, most people, you know, I follow a lot of people on Strava, I see what everybody's doing, um, but I can describe what I do, I guess. Um, 
I do like a mixture of tempo running, interval training. So that's like generally a little faster than tempo pace um, and, you know, shorter intervals, higher repetition. Um, I do runs at marathon pace up to like, I think the longest run I did at marathon pace was 12 miles. Um, and I do my recovery runs really, really slow. So, I mean, that's, that's like the easiest part of your training plan is the recovery runs, but I think it's one of the most critical parts. And I think something that, um, a lot of people leave out or, you know, don't take so seriously. Um, so yeah, so I would do about two, two workout days a week. Um, and a really a long run on the weekend and everything else in between was recovery running. So my brother has been helping me by coaching me. Um, he started coaching me last fall for the wine glass marathon that I was supposed to do. However, I was not able to do because I ended up getting a stress fracture in my foot. Um, but up until then, uh, I guess I didn't start using him because maybe I didn't think I was ready for his type of training plan. Um, and also I was, I was training with my team. So if I were to, um, like deviate from their plan, I wouldn't have people to work out with. Um, but after my brother ran in the 2016 trials, uh, for, for the marathon, I, um, I decided that it was time to give him a chance to coach me um, because I wanted to go to the trials with him for 2020. Um, so, and anyway, even when I was following like the Dashing Whippets plan, he was still calling me like every day to ask me how my workout went and this and that, you know, we're, we're really close and we're both pretty obsessed with running. So we talk a lot about running all the time. So it only made sense that he would make a plan for me. Um, so he did, he made like an 18 week plan for me for the Boston Marathon. I followed it pretty much religiously, though he, he was making minor adjustments for me here and there because I would hurt myself a little bit or I would get sick or I would have a lot going on with work or social events some week and he would just, you know, work around that and make sure, make sure I got my training in um, and got done what I needed to get done. For the Olympic trials, uh, the women for the B standard need to run a 245, well, under 245. Uh, so I have a 245.23 now after Boston. So I'm a little um, short on that. Uh, that was my goal actually, was to get the trial time. Um, but I'm not too worried about it. I think uh, after what I did in Boston, I, I feel like almost invincible. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, seriously, I, I think I have two marathons lined up. I have Berlin Marathon in September, California International in December. So those are both, um, known to be very fast courses, a lot of competition. So I think I'm just gonna do it there. The prize money payout for the uh, top 15 at the Boston Marathon this year has been a little controversial. Um, the reason being, um, I'll try to explain. Um, for those that don't know how it works, the professional women start at 9.32 a.m. The non-professional women plus the men, like all the men, elite and non-elite, start at 10. Um, in order to start with professional women at 9.32 a.m., you have to hit a qualifying time, which is, it changes everywhere, every year. It's not, um, it's not like a set standard all the time. So it's, it's pretty much like up to the BAA's discretion, I guess, on who can be in there. So you can't just say, hey, I want to run with the professionals and, and start up there on the line with those women. Like you have to, you have to qualify. So with that, starting the professional 
uh, wave, you can qualify for the prize money. Those who don't start with them cannot. However, for the men, since they are all starting at once, they all are allowed to qualify for the money. I won't go into the why because it's, uh, it doesn't entirely make sense to me. Um, so, I mean, you could ask someone that agreed with the rules <laughs> why the, the, they are the way they are. Um, in my opinion, it just limits the field too much. So 46 women started in the professional wave. That means only 46 women are chasing after 15 prize slots, whereas, you know, over, like thousands of men are chasing after those prize slots. So it is a little bit, it pre presents an inequality to women, um, whether it's intentional or not. Um, it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, women should, they, they should be able to make it so that both men and women have the same opportunity and are um, like fighting after the same prizes. I don't have a solution for them, but uh, I mean, I think they could probably come up with one fairly easily because not all races are like this. So everyone keeps telling me that I beat Shalane Flanagan, um, <laughs> and I don't, I, I mean, Shalane Flanagan is a hero of mine. I literally, whenever I feel tired in a race, I think about Shalane Flanagan racing down Fifth Avenue, about to round into Central Park to take the win at the New York City Marathon. And that's like my inspiration image that I, I, I turn to whenever I feel really tired. Um, the fact that my time beat her in the marathon <laughs> does not make me uh, look any less up to her than I, than I always have. Um, she's amazing. Uh, she had a bad race and I, I felt really bad actually because I wanted her to win that day. Um, I mean, I'm happy Desi Linden won. That's that's amazing. But I know that it was supposed to be Shalane's um, like last last big competitive marathon, and I knew she just won New York City. So I really wanted her to get the, both of those cities. Um, yeah. So I mean, she's really inspired me this entire training cycle since New York City marathon. I've had her finishing picture as the background on my phone. Um, just to, because it reminds me of my goals and um, everything I'm working for. Okay, so nutrition leading up to the race day. Um, I read a ton of articles and like ex excerpts from books on taper food and like carb loading and stuff like that. Um, and what I was generally getting is that you should eat 90 to 95% of your calories and carbohydrates the three days leading up to the marathon, um, not like going over your normal normal calorie uh, requirement, but just changing the macronutrients. So the, it should be almost exclusively carbohydrates. So that's what I did. Um, I wasn't super calculated about it, but I mean, I would go for like rice instead of lettuce, um, oatmeal instead of Greek yogurt. Um, Two days before, uh, we got into Boston and we're trying to eat lunch and we were just like, oh, we need, we need carbs. So actually, we went to Chipotle <laughs> and I was like, should I get a burrito bowl or a burrito? And I was like, I need that tortilla for the extra carbohydrates. So I ate a burrito like 36 hours before the marathon. Um, but I didn't put a ton of hot sauce on it and I was, I was scanty on the beans. <laughs> um, and then the day of the race, I had pancakes for breakfast with my team after we did our shakeout. And uh, then my roommates and I bought a giant like army sized thing of animal crackers and we snacked on that through the day. And then I had pasta for dinner. I mean, hydration is key all the time. You always want to be hydrated if you're training really heavily. 
Um, during the race, I took fluid at just about every single fluid station. Um, probably 20 out of the 25 or however many there are. <clears throat> and the only reason I didn't do it every single time is because sometimes I just couldn't get through the crowds to get to this fluid station. Um, I also took a gel at every 10K, so um, I brought those with me. So I had four on the course. Well, I work as a nurse practitioner. I've been doing this almost three years now. Prior to that, I was a registered nurse for about five years. Um, I guess I went into nursing for the natural reason why most people go into nursing or healthcare in general, and that's because it's a really rewarding career. Um, you know, I feel like I really, I have a strong purpose. I help people every day. Um, and I mean, also there was the fact that I'm, in, I'm interested in science um, and physiology and stuff like that. So that really struck my interest um, when, I, when I started thinking about going to the healthcare field. Um, and yeah, I think my interest in the physiology uh, kind of goes along with running. I, I read a lot of like the exercise physiology books um, that some uh, coaches write and I try to incorporate what I learn into like my training and everything. I guess one message that I would like to send to other runners is that you can really do anything that you set your mind to. Um, a positive attitude will go a really long way. Um, if you tell yourself you can't do something, then you can't do it. If you tell yourself you can, then, you know, that will take you to the moon. Um, I'm, right now I'm reading the Dina Castor book, Let Your Mind Run, um, and it's all about, like, how, how much running is a mental sport and it's so true um, you know it's not it's not all physical it's not all about the training it's about your attitude um, and and putting your mind into it so that's the strategy that has worked for me the most I think and if you set your mind to what you want to do then you can do whatever you want to do too <laughs>